Welcome back to World 101X. And here we're with Kim de Rijk at the University of Queensland. You're an anthropologist here. And maybe just to, to kick us off, what I've asked lots of anthropologists around the world on our, on our journey mm. is, how did you get into anthropology? What drew you into the field? Well, I guess this is, uh, for many, uh, it is uh, similar to me, a long story, but um, um, I guess it started uh, when I was about 19 years old, uh, back in Holland, where I'm from originally, um, reading some of the, I guess, uh, classical Dutch literature. And one of the, uh, the highlights of Dutch literature is a piece from the 19th century um, about colonial experiences in Indonesia. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, one of the highlights of Dutch literature, which is an, uh, by an author who was part of the colonial administration in Indonesia, uh, but uh, criticized uh, the colonial practices in, in Indonesia. And um, this really, um, I guess you might say, opened my eyes to the experience of Indonesians uh, under Dutch rule. Uh, and opened my eyes to a particular perspective that we might apply to what was then still called non-Western uh, societies and culture, um, which really inspired me to think more broadly about culture, uh, colonial histories, um, and drew me really into the study of anthropology. Uh, and uh, so, you know, after my high school, I then uh, went to Nijmegen, um, where I studied uh, social and cultural anthropology, yeah. And do you think coming from the Netherlands you have a different appreciation of anthropology? Is there a different canon? You mentioned this Dutch author, who, who, who was he? Well, he, he published under uh, a, a pseudonym, but uh, Multatuli, I suffered much in Latin um, because of his colonial experience. Um, but. Um, I'm not sure. I guess the Dutch are not particularly known for a, partic for, for, for a particular anthropological perspective. Rather, um, if, I, if I could put it that way, um, Dutch anthropology um, is really the exploration of all the perspectives, you know, the, the classical English, uh, British um, perspectives and the Amer American um, uh, perspectives and so on. And we, I guess, just try to pick out, you know, um, the best perspectives. Um, mm. We're not we're not really known for high-profile um, anthropologists in Holland. I don't think. I mean, part of my Dutch colleagues, um, but um, yeah, it's. I think in Holland um, it, there is a very good, wide-ranging explorations of the perspectives in anthropology. Yeah. So, having had that Dutch experience mm. and having done a PhD mm. in Australia. Mm. Um, what kind of definition, what sort of shorthand do you use for what is anthropology? Well, I guess fitting with that uh, exploratory approach to anthropology in Holland, um, uh, and I, I presume many uh, have said this, that uh, you know, anthropology is, is you know, for me, uh, the, the very broad exploration of what it means to be human uh, in this world. and. Um, uh, I was on my way to this interview. I um, I was talking about this with my children in the car. Um, How old are they? They are. My son is ten, and my daughter is eight. And um, I asked him. Gerhard will probably ask me, "What is anthropology?" And um, so we had a bit of a talk about it. And uh, my son said, um, "Well, Dad, um, it's it's certainly not boring." Um, and um, that's certainly true. I think it's very exciting. And uh, he said it's very interesting. Um, because he goes with me occasionally on field work and um, hears me talk about the questions I ask. And my eight-year-old daughter said, um, Dad, it's very unexpected. Um, me, and she said, you know, you were looking at water um, and then you went to look at food. And so the, the questions shift. And she's on the spot there, I think, that um, as we do our work, uh, we, um, we go into the field with certain questions and then the field unexpectedly throws up new questions which we then pursue um, and I think that is very much part of anthropology, the, the, the kind of ongoing questioning of what, what we think and what we see and this dialectic in a sense between our own intellectual um, uh, pursuits and, and what we find in the field in real life so to speak. 
Um, You've already mentioned mm. two really big ticket items, water and food. I mean, yes. that's something we, we're in contact with every day. Yes. Um, and the issue we're going to talk about next is energy. Yes. Uh, again, three huge issues. Can yes. you just take us from your PhD mm. to your postdoctoral work? Sure. Sort of yeah, so I, I started my PhD uh, in 2008 um, following the announcement of a big dam uh, just outside Brisbane here um, on the Mary River, uh, which resulted in a, in a huge conflict um, where local residents were to be, um, I guess, uh, removed from this valley, uh, which was going to be flooded, um, which really triggered my interest uh, in how people, because there was a, a huge campaign to stop this dam, right? And so this dam, in many ways, divided communities, uh, but also brought them together in an interesting way around water. Um, and so created a new sense of community, if you like, um, but also destroyed another form of it. Um, and that's what really kind of, you know, was the topic of my PhD uh, on water, place, and community. Uh, those were the three big, big topics of my PhD. Um, and um, I guess environmental anthropology, um, applying um, the, yeah, the broader perspectives from my environmental anthropology, sense of place, you know, what you might call em emplaced identities and so on, and, and how um, in a society like Australia, which is relatively young, how um, what my course as a nation state. as a nation state indeed sorry um, how we might understand um, the forms of belonging among what you might call settler descendants uh, uh, to to this relatively new nation um, and how people become uh, attached to place um, and how that played out in the context of this dam dispute um, so that then when I finished that um, which was in t 2011, uh, 12, um, there was a huge dispute brewing very close to Brisbane, just inland, um, which has everything to do with energy. And um, that to me appeared to be a, um, a kind of you know, in, in our face uh, issue that needed exploration from an anthropologist. And, um, that has to do with unconventional gas. Um, so what is coal, unconventional? Well, gas? so people might know it um, in in the fra in the terms that we hear most often in in the media, fracking, um, shale gas. Um, in in Australia, mostly coal seam gas. So this is um, gas that is um, underground, but unconventional in the sense that it is not in huge, uh, uh, I guess, reservoirs but held in uh, widely dispersed underground formations in pockets uh, or, or, or cleats in, in these um, coal seams or, or shale um, layers and requires many wells uh, to get access to this gas uh, um, and um, is therefore unconventional. I mean, there's a bigger story to be told here, but um, that, that's in a, in a nutshell what, what unconventional gas is. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like in terms of um, most people will be familiar with oil wells or yeah. oil rigs offshore, mm. but this is quite different, as it you is. say, because there's lots and lots of wells, indeed, relatively small mm. in footprint, but they're all connected. Yes. So yes. there's a. Well, uh, I mean, the best way to visualize this is from the air, um, and Google Earth is really. Um, uh, very productive in this sense to see what this looks like on a, on a larger scale. So, as you say, um, unconventional gas requires many wells to be drilled um, in, in um, and that's very different from conventional gas where you might have ten wells which produce a lot of the gas. Um, here you need hundreds, thousands, you know, uh, of wells. In the US, um, many, many thousands have now been drilled. Um, and so we have a, a very big footprint, uh, even though the, the well itself is very small um, and requires perhaps a hectare or less. Um, we have many of them, all connected with pipelines um, and needs you know, additional infrastructure, compressor stations, some of the things we've seen uh, in the gas fields, uh, which then all connect 
to um, a massive uh, kind of um, corridor and the corridor we've also seen uh, that then transports the gas to um, processing facilities um, on Curtis Island near Clapston, many hundreds of kilometres away where the gas is uh, chilled and, and converted into a LNG, liquid natural gas, uh, and uh, this liquid can then be transported across the world. So that, that last point um, I make also because um, that brings in the global connected kind of perspective, right? So uh, I guess we start big with the big energy questions where um, energy production, of course, is um, very fundamental to our ways of life. Um, changes in energy production have huge social consequences um, and um, you know we, we are kind of used to switching on the light uh, and it's kind of you know taken for granted that electricity is there that when we cook the gas is there um, but these kinds of resources are produced somewhere um, they come from somewhere and there's a whole network of production associated with this, with um, with wells, with material, you know, properties um, that result in, in quite dramatic transformations in the landscape and um, uh, the regions where people live. Now, most most of the because we're a very visual culture, most of the impacts, uh, you know, what we see, and one thing that's been striking following around in the field has actually been how a lot of the wells were either, you know, they were painted in camouflage or they were almost hidden behind some trees. So it was actually very difficult to see. Mm. And in your work, you've, you've expanded this, the visual into not just 2D, but 3D into what's beneath, what lies beneath the surface. Can yeah. you tell us more about that? Well, I, I think that's a really um, fascinating and uh, a productive way of looking at what is going on in an extractive industry. So what, what this perspective off for me was actually looking at Google Earth, right, from satellite imagery, looking from the top down, um, where it was apparent to me, and we stopped at this place in the field where we have a coal mine, you can see a coal mine, we can see gas wells around it, and then we can see farming all in the same region, very close to each other, which is only visible from the air. We, we couldn't see it, right? We tried to, but we couldn't. So this kind of surface dynamic is only visual uh, to, to be seen from the air. Now, um, but however, all that kind of contest over land use relates to what is underneath the surface as well. There is the coal underneath, which determines where gas wells are located. There is particularly productive coal where the coal mine is, is related. And there's access to underground water, which is where the, the farming is, is uh, located. So that started me, uh, started my thinking about verticality, about the relations between the underground and the surface. Um, that's where geology comes in, right? Um, I mean, we saw the example of the farmer who has access to the water. Um, this brings together the availability of water next door, where particular infrastructure is located at the surface, which is inspired by the geology underneath. The farmer is on the productive black soil, um, which is suitable for irrigation and so on. So all these underground surface relations emerge uh, in transformations that are going on at the moment. And um, so I think we should apply you know, what you might call a 3D perspective uh, to this kind of environmental context. And um, I, I think also, um, stepping back again, um, we see, uh, in the case of Michael, we see huge corridors um, being built um, which bring together all this gas and water and so on from an entire region, um, connecting you know, the farmer who is very much focused on his property, connecting him with you know, export markets at the coast and global energy markets uh, worldwide. Um, so that really, I think, in a perhaps typical anthropology fashion, takes us from the global perspective to the highly localized um, farming perspective, if you like, and back. Um, and, and throughout that analysis, we might, I think, usefully apply a 3D kind of um, uh, approach where we, we also look at what's going on underground. Um, how do people know the underground? 
place infrastructure at the surface um, and how we might understand that also from visualizations and technologies, using technologies uh, like satellite imagery and so on, to understand um, uh, more fulsome uh, these kinds of new and emerging energy uh, industries. Maybe let's start talking about this issue of place and belonging in, yes. in, in terms of... So you've talked about the global impacts of how one well that we've mm. seen in, mm. in you know, 300 kilometers west of Brisbane is yes. connected to the world Indeed. Uh, through the global gas market, right? Mm. But as you say, there is a, there's a local impact. Mm. So can you tell us a little bit about notions of place and belonging that you've used to make sense of that sort of impact it's had on the landscape? Yeah, look, I, part of my research here has a historical component. I, I think uh, it is very important to, if we are to understand what is here now, and the people who live in a particular place, we need to understand how, they came, how that place came to be. Um, and in the Darling Downs, where we've been, um, there's a fascinating history, um, as, in, as in all places for that matter, um, where we see quite uh, dramatic transformations over time since what you might call colonial um, experiences started, which is not all that long ago, um, uh, say 160 years ago uh, in some places. Um, we see, um, I guess, um, uh, well, firstly, uh, the d dislocation of Aboriginal populations, right? Um, and we see in explorers' attitudes to this environment a strong focus on natural resources. So we see glowing reports of luxurious grasslands suitable for cattle and so on. We see reports about um, abundant coal lying at the surface in creeks and so on, um, indicating that early, uh, I guess, uh, views of this environment were heavily focused on extraction and, and the use of resources, um, which then brought in a, a pastoral industry um, and uh, mining, extractive practices and so on. So there, there were coal mines? There were coal mines. 100 years ago. Indeed. 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, 100 years ago, we've, we've seen some of the, um, the heritage now um, in that region uh, refers back to that coal mining history. And the, this, I think, is very important in understanding what is here today because we see um, uh, at that site where there was an old coal mine, um, we see now very productive agricultural land. Now, that agricultural land is there actually because of that coal mine, because when the coal mine went bust, uh, the, the, um, the coal workers were given land uh, around the coal mine um, who then cleared that land and made it um, into the kind of agricultural land that it is today. Um, and while we see now among farmers a very um, anti-coal attitude in some of these regions, um, you know, this kind of historical transformation um, uh, makes that story much more complex, right? Uh, where the background of farming is very strongly related to coal mining and this kind of extractive history. Um, so, yeah, and then, and then taking that further, we see um, as agriculture developed, um, we see also a, a, you know, a, a, the increased use of technology, um, where um, uh, we see a form of agriculture that is best described as agribusiness, right? Industrial agriculture in many ways. Um, where, uh, you know, we've seen the example where uh, a farmer might uh, control irrigation equipment with his iPhone, right? Where the land is laser leveled, um, where um, genetically modified crops are introduced, where tractors are um, guided by GPS uh, technology and so on. Um, but lastly, I, I just um, also want to point out that despite this agricultural history, there is also other, um, uh, you know, w with the, with the um, establishment of, of regional towns and so on, um, we also see urban people coming in, particularly in the last 20 years or so, um, for lifestyle purposes, to live among the greenery, if you like, live on a nice, um, nice block of land, quiet, um, who, who don't want to live in the city anymore, who want to experience a quiet rural lifestyle. 
So in each of these cases, the place, that land, has a mm. different, on the one hand, one could call it use value, mm. but also just, you know, you have a different attachment, I guess, right? Some, some, some people have been there for generations. Indeed. Other people haven't, but they still have a great attachment to their block of land, to the greenery, as you say. That, that's, that's, um, that's why this background is important, to understand how people today experience, attach themselves to this land. Um, I think that it, that is vital in understanding what goes on today, and also vital in understanding how different, if you like, categories of persons respond to a new emerging extractive industry like unconventional gas that is now really um, developing rapidly uh, in this region. And mm. another issue here is social impacts, right? Mm. We've talked about the mm. landscape, we've talked about the impact it has on, on the actual greenery, the, the trees being cleared mm. for different mm. um, extractive mm. industries. Mm. Um, but what about social impacts? Um, and it's, it's difficult to talk about winners and losers, mm. but can you give us some insight into who has benefited from the coming in of a new extractive industry yeah. and what kind of benefits they have, have been and are yes, yes. and who hasn't? Yes. Well, um, just as a background, I teach social impact assessment here at, uh, at UQ. Um, this is um, an interesting field where we might apply some of our anthropological thinking and concepts to um, a very practical kind of situation, right? So, yes, you say winners and losers, um, though it's much more complex, of course, than just sure. black and white. Um, yes, um, social impacts are difficult to analyze, but um, I guess one of the things that we want to do is have a differentiated approach to what we might call the community. I mean, mm. all too often there is a rather simplistic view of the rural community. And I think during our um, field um, experiences there, we've seen that this is actually much more varied than we might think. So we've seen um, some who benefit tremendously from this new um, industry through, uh, for instance, the availability of new water resources that um, will in some cases triple the agricultural production of some farmers. Um, so they, they are now uh, they have access now to, to pr um, treated water that is produced as part of the, the unconventional gas extraction. And, um, and we have to mention, I mean, that area has been in a long period of drought, so water is a, a hugely important asset. Very much so. And um, water is, is, is critical to this whole region. So um, in, in large parts of that region, water is underground. Um, so they draw water through water bores. They have long been dependent on this water. Um, the unconventional gas industry extracts a lot of water, uh, so that it has created a lot of the debate, right? What is the impact of this industry on underground water? Um, and particularly what is uh, um, called in, in, in Australia the Great Artesian Basin, which is a vast, vast uh, underground uh, reservoir, if you like, um, which, which spans about a fifth of the entire Australian continent, one of the largest aquifers in the world, um, with water up to two million years old. Um, and farmers have been long, and, and settlements, towns for that matter, have long been dependent on this water. Uh, so huge anxieties have arisen uh, about the potential impacts on this water and consequently on the future livelihoods of people who depend on this water. Now, as I said, some farmers have now got access to treated water. So this, this water is treated in reverse osmosis plants and made available to farmers for irrigation. These farmers are looking at potentially tripling their production. Uh, so huge uh, economic benefits to them. Um, other farmers, however, like for instance Michael, who we've interviewed, um, don't have access to this water. Instead. Um, will have infrastructure on their, on their land, will get some compensation for that impact and so on, um, but benefit, it is fair to say, much less uh, than those farmers who get access to water and so on. Now, there's also farmers who we, we haven't visited, but further west the properties are very large, much larger than we visited, so these farmers potentially have a hundred gas wells on their land. Um, 
they receive compensation for each well and therefore might have might receive quite a um, substantial um, monetary compensation which which um, assists them in in drought proofing as well right to to um, to to have that additional income is very useful for them in cases of drought and so on now in other cases again uh, we see people who uh, don't get jobs for example that's another one of course that it has brought a lot of jobs to the region particularly in in the period of construction um, that period has now gone we the t we visited and the construction is nearly finished um, so the jobs uh, have been temporary but many of them were there um, is it fair to say that say towns have profited um, in, in some respects from from that infrastructure period in, in terms of jobs and income and uh, yeah though I guess towns is, is a is a generalized statement some some in the towns have so um, people who had motels for example were booked out for the last few years a, a major bonanza for for those people um, if you in some way were capable of servicing this boom the, the workers uh, and so on uh, if you had say a transport business uh, you had uh, trucks that you could uh, that you could become a, a contractor to the industry you would you could potentially do very well um, so yes um, a number of um, uh, businesses have done very well, though others, again, and this is typical of this kind of social impact assessment, have done, uh, have had a very hard time. So if you had, say, uh, a mechanic shop fixing cars, um, you would find it very difficult to um, keep employees because they could make a fortune in the gas industry. You would have to raise uh, the salaries of your employees um, and even then they would often leave uh, for the gas industry, so it has put pressure on some, um, it has benefited others, uh, and others again, um, like perhaps the lady um, we interviewed in Tara, who had a, a news agency, has a news agency, has benefited for some time, um, but perhaps not to the extent that they had expected. Um, so that is that is very much part of social impact. Um, we. Perhaps I, I might just add, uh, importantly, that there's, with respect to the people I mentioned who came to the region for lifestyle purposes, who wanted to enjoy a qu quiet rural lifestyle, um, and were p for, from particular social backgrounds, um, uh, who in, in social impact terms we might consider to be uh, part of a vulnerable group, um, and, and social impact assessment should always focus strongly on those most vulnerable to, to uh, impacts. Um, those people very close to the gas fields um, have perhaps um, felt the impacts most strongly because they have not benefited in terms of jobs or, or uh, didn't want to um, become involved with the gas industry, uh, wanted this to go away in many ways, they just want to enjoy their, their lifestyle, but were drawn in to a gas field in that way, right? Um, and this has created a, a lot of tension and that's where the activism was most prominent. Now we've talked a lot about benefits but mm. as you say some people haven't benefited but mm. some people are actually also very opposed mm. um, and don't see it as a, as, as a benefit to the region mm. at all. Mm. Mm. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about the activism that's arisen in this area mm. and, and some of the um, problems people have had health-wise for instance? Yes. Well um, there's been uh, now for a number of years um, a strong activism about unconventional gas fracking um, generally in Australia uh, under the umbrella organization of Loctagate uh, which has seen a tremendous kind of um, proliferation a growth um, across Australia and for that matter around the world um, fracking has become a very contentious issue um, and in this region of the Darling Downs, this is where Loctagate started. Um, this is where unconventional gas started in Australia. Um, and early, from early on, there were huge concerns uh, among residents in this region, uh, particularly, I guess, among those that I've just referred to, uh, people like John, who live in these, um, in these regions for lifestyle purposes, who want, to, who want quiet, who want uh, a nice environment and so on, 
people in very close to the gas fields as well, they um, started uh, complaining about health effects very early on. So um, reports about nosebleeds, rashes, uh, to do with the produced water, uh, pollution, um, and so on, started emerging early on uh, as the gas industry expanded. So when you're talking about activism, can you tell us a bit more about, you know, in different contexts, people who are activists, sometimes they come from the city, sometimes they come from different areas, they have different um, agendas. So can you tell us about what, what the dynamics are in, in the Darling Downs? Well, that's a good question, Gerhard. I, one of the, I might focus on one, one issue in particular here, and, and that is um, quite fundamental to activism, I think, more broadly, um, is who is local? That is, seems to me to be one of the key questions, contested questions, mm. that pops up everywhere, including in the Darling Downs. The question is, who can speak for a particular area? Who has authority? Um, and that relates to particular um, definitions, if you like, different, different understandings of who is local. So some people might say, well, you only people who have, say, four generation who have been in the, in the region for four generations can um, um, speak with authority for that region. Others might say, well, no, that, that, that's not the only criteria. We live here, we've been here, um, this is my place. I can speak for this region too. Um, now, you know, th this is a contested issue, so some argue, well, those people living in Brisbane who are concerned about fracking uh, and might go to demonstrations in gas fields um, are often um, portrayed as um, either uh, professional activists or uh, people who don't belong, who have no authority to speak, right? So this is, this is very um, fundamental to activism to create a sense of uh, belonging and authority to speak for a certain area. Now, um, in Queensland, there is particular political agendas at work here too, where focused on this this, this exact issue where um, new laws aim to restrict those who can make submissions about particular projects, cutting out uh, others who may wish to have a say also. Um, and you might relate this to broader environmental issues in the world where um, urban activists in Brisbane might be concerned about the rainforest in Brazil, even though they may not, never have been there. Now, we might say this is a valid concern um, related to perhaps climate change and global processes um, where others might want to restrict those who can speak um, and say, well, this is a matter for Brazilians, for those who live in the Amazon only, uh, while others say, no, no, this is a broader human question that affects us all. Um, and that is, that is very much what is going on about fracking um, and unconventional gas in Australia as well. Who can speak, who is local, who belongs. Mm, and, and in your work, you use yeah. the concept of phenomenology Indeed. to yeah. make sense of some of those impacts. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that and, and what sort of um, senses you, you're working on? Your well, work? uh, I think John's um, narrative was very instructive in that regard. I mean, uh, this is a broader approach in anthropology where we might study uh, phenomenologically, that is, we are in the world as human beings with bodies that sense the world. We smell, we feel, we hear, um, we taste. Uh, and this is very important to our experience of the world, of the environment. Um, and this is a very um, useful perspective to apply to extractive industries as well. And we, we see how, in John's example, John often speaks about the lack of smell in his case. People, and, I, and I've interviewed other people who's, who report they can no longer smell anything. Um, who, who, you know, when, when John talks about impacts, he, he will bring out his um, Geiger meter, right? Because of the anxiety surrounding radioactive um, uh, material emerging from this industry, you can't see these things, right? You can't see radioactivity. Um, uh, you hear compressor stations, which you know um, impact on your on your lifestyle. You 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 see different things. You see massive flares in in the dark, where previously you saw stars, 
for, for that matter. Um, so the whole sensory experience of living in a gas field um, is, is very instructive um, in trying to understand the variety of impacts, beneficial and negative, if you like, um, because we might similarly apply this to, um, say, the farmer who has access to the water, where suddenly the field is green, right? The colors change, you know, before your eyes. There are no, it's not the, the yellow uh, of Australian summers, it is green, the productivity is visual, there is water there, the sound of water and so on. Um, so these are very much sensory experiences as well as they are economic um, uh, developments and, and um, transformations of relations to place. Mm. I think that's a great place then. Thank you so much, Kim.